All right, we need you to come back. All of our vineyards are tuning in and they're waiting in their various locales. And here we're sitting having tea and crumpets or a Canadian facsimile of that. Come on back. Well, I would like to introduce to you, first of all, not our, not our guest speaker, but one of our two national directors who is going to bring you a bit of a welcome, and then she is going to introduce our guest speaker. So I would love it if you would welcome Anita. Anita Roos, come on up, Anita. Um, this is one of the favorite uh, activities that David and I get to do in this role. We get to visit family from coast to coast and be with our friends. And um, we have just had a blast, actually, the last few days being with family. It's really, really cool. It gives me a deeper appreciation um, for who we are as a family. So thank you, thank you, thank you for hosting us. Uh, in every way, we felt welcomed. There's this wonderful advice in Scripture in the New Testament that says, when you've been welcomed into a home, leave a blessing. And so I would like to bless this home, bless this place of sanctuary and welcome. And thank you for who you are and what you have offered to the rest of us as your family here in British Columbia. We um, have had the last few days where we have taken as a region a few moments to just gather together, first of all, with our leaders. So we gathered with our leaders for a couple days at the beginning of our time together and just felt the Lord speaking to us of... Um, what it means to be a people who finish well. And I think as we look across the scope of uh, the church in present day, it's so easy to uh, get caught up in the frenzy and the fear uh, that we, we uh, absorb from the society and the cultures around us. And it creeps into the fabric of the church. And I think that can um, happen when we as leaders lose that sense of who we are and what we are and where we're going. So I think for those first couple days, we explored that as leaders. And then that whole theme of finding God uh, truly in every season in our lives um, carried on to the rest of our conference. And we saw the Lord just meet us in a really awesome way. So... Coming from um, the regional team, we just say thank you for what you as a community did for us and facilitated for us. And as a national, um, coming from the national purview, we are just thrilled at what we see here, not only in British Columbia, we as a family are growing together in our own unity. We're getting kinder. We're more aware of our stuff. Uh, less grouchy. It's, it's actually really helpful. Um, and we're thrilled with uh, the leadership even in this province where we've taken the posture where we're not going to pretend that we don't have any elephants in the room. We're going to talk about our stuff. We're going to take things head on. We're going to learn to process and communicate and uh, be good Christians. So that's really thrilling. And uh, we just say... What a joy to be here. We have this awesome couple that has come from our friends. Well, they're friends from the States. And uh, we just love both of them. They're regional leaders. And uh, they're on the national team in the States. And they have so much to offer us, uh, both as individuals and as a couple. And so we have appreciated what they have brought us over the last few days. They have sown, they have prayed, um, they have invited us to deeper places in Jesus. And so we're 
we're so grateful that we get to be family with our um, cousins from the south. And so we just welcome Rose. I welcome Rose. She's going to share this morning. And I just have to say personally, Rose, thank you, thank you, thank you for being obedient to listen to Jesus, for being a woman of the Spirit, and thank you for sharing with us all that you have. And I just would like to pray for you this morning. Lord, thank you for family. Thank you that you love family, that you instituted family. This was your idea. And thank you for the gifts the gift that we can be to one another. Thank you for Rose. Thank you for the gift that she is to our family, our national family, and to us in, here in BC. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to her, that you would draw from that rich place of her relationship with you, her journey with you, God, and that you would speak to our hearts, that you would challenge us, that you would open us up a little deeper that you would reveal truth to us, God, through the things that she has to share this morning. So bless her, God. Give her clarity and understanding, wisdom and revelation, we ask, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, um, I want to echo for Rich and I, thank you for your hospitality. All of you have just welcomed us in and provided for everything. And we've been so, so blessed to be here. So this morning, uh, I want to just talk a little bit about inviting, the invitation of God, that God is in his very nature an inviting God. He invites all of us to the table, all of us to the celebration. In fact, when we read through our story, the big story, it sort of ends in this banquet, this, this beautiful feast that we're all going to take part of. And so I wanted to just start again. Part of what we did through the conference was try to remind ourselves of the big story that we've been invited to be a part of, that all of us are a part of, that started even before creation, really, and that's where I kind of want to start today is with the Trinity, our Trinitarian God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, a mystery that we don't all quite get how that works out, but it's been portrayed even in art. I think we have a picture um, in, in art of uh, at a table, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you look really closely at this picture, there's an extra chair that's there to depict how everybody, each one of us is invited to join them at this table. Now, I believe at the center of the cosmos is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this divine dance. Our early church fathers call, call it perichoresis, which means um, divine dance. Perichoresis, we actually get the word for choreography out of that Greek word that they depicted the Trinity at the center of the universe in this, in this relationship of mutual loving and giving and sharing and submission and mutuality, and that they just, the three of them just overflow in love. In fact, they had so much love, they couldn't even contain it in the cosmos that it just exploded and, and creation came. Some people have that thought that that's how the burst of, of energy came that brought the very creation. Now, Eugene Peterson has a way of describing this divine dance, this, this, this community at, of love that's at the center of the cosmos in this dance. And they're, they're, what they're doing is they're inviting everything and everyone into them, into God, into this invitation of God. And so he, he describes them as swirling around the cosmos, just drawing everything and everybody. We don't even know it, that all of us come to Jesus by being drawn by the Spirit of God. We're drawn, and then we're graced to say yes to the invitation. So Eugene Peterson describes this dance this way, that at the center of the universe, this divine dance is happening, just drawing, drawing, drawing. So he calls it holy communion, that we are created for community, just like the, the Trinity is a community, the Godhead is a community of these three in one, and, and we are created in that image. So we are created and hardwired for community. So he calls this divine dance Holy Communion, where, where the Spirit of God, the Trinitarian God, is drawing people to community, 
people that don't even un know that they're being drawn into that. So we could see people that, um, that don't know Jesus. They're not followers of Jesus, but they are drawn to community. And why do you think Facebook and Twitter is so explosive around the world? It's community. It's people connecting because we are hardwired for community. So there's holy communion, community. There's holy salvation all over the world. We're watching people that don't even know Jesus have hearts for refugees, right? Like you have groups of people. They're not necessarily Christian people, but they are doing good work in this world. They're being drawn in. So, so holy salvation, saving people from the, the horrors of this world. And we could just look at the refugee crisis around the world and see good people that want to make a difference. That, that's holy salvation. That is the work of the Trinitarian God, pulling people that don't even know that they're serving this Trinity into holy salvation. And then the third thing is holy creation. So people that care, like we can think about Greenpeace or Save the Whales or any, any organization that is not necessarily founded through Christianity, but what they're doing is they're being drawn into this, this work of the Trinitarian God that is literally sucking everything and everything into their swirl, this swirl of love. So this morning, I just want to take a few minutes and talk about this in relationship to us, that God is an inviting God. God is at work all the time. Like that is just what the Trinity is doing, is inviting, 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 including, 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 inviting us into this, this beautiful celebration of love. So God, we're invited by God. We respond in different ways to that invitation. And then what does God tell us? We are to be um, transformed into Christ-likeness for the sake of others. That's, that's sort of the goal of our, our faith in following Jesus, is to be transformed into Christ-likeness for the sake of others. So as we respond to invitation, and it doesn't just happen once, we're invited all the time into more and more and more of this divine dance, right? It's like our, as our faith deepens, we're invited into deeper places with the Spirit of God, with the triune God. But then we're to be an inviting people. We're, to, we're also to be inviting. We're to participate with God's invitation to people in our lives where we live, where we work, where we play. We're to be about participating in that invitation. A few weeks ago, as I was thinking about this message, I put on my Facebook page. I mean, I love Holy Communion. I'm a Facebook girl, Twitter, Instagram. I am like addicted to social media, which is not such a great thing at times, but, but I just think I'm in community. So, um, so I just put on my Facebook page, when you hear the word invitation, what do you think of? And here's some of the responses I got. Party. There's some place I'm not allowed unless someone there tells me I can come. A small card, <laughs> welcome. So, so many people said, welcome, welcome, welcome. I mean, I, there was probably 10 people that said welcome. When they hear the word invitation, they, they hear welcome. Included, wedding, special event, decision, dance, wedding, birthday, altar call, <laughs> adventure, a party, discernment, something that's gonna cost me. That's interesting. Wanted, wanted, included, welcome as a choice. The one invited can actually choose or um, can choose if they if they're want to respond to the invitation. Invited. So I, I think that we have this, this twofold thing going on all the time in our lives where we have the creator of the universe, the Trinitarian God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit continually inviting us to learn more and more and more about him, to be in life with him, to follow in the way that Jesus told us to live our lives. And then that Trinitarian God provides the grace and the strength for us to respond to the invitation. Like it's all grace, you guys. It's all grace that God has provided for us. And then he asks us to be an inviting people, to include people at the table, especially those that are marginalized by the church. Like somehow, here we go, somehow <laughs> we got to this place at the dawn of the 21st century in some of our churches where we've put up these barriers of who's in and who's out. That's never, ever, ever been 
the plan of God. The plan of God is that everyone is invited to the table. We, I mean, all you have to do is do a study in the Gospels of Jesus, who he had meals with. And it will just open your eyes. Like, who, I mean, this is what got him killed. It got him killed because of his table fellowship. He said he eats with sinners. He eats with drunkards. He eats with prostitutes. And like the religious people of his day were pissed. Like, what are you doing? Who are you? Who is this guy? He, he eats with sinners. So somehow we've got to get back to this place where we first are people that are open and responding to the invitation of the Lord. And then we join God in inviting others to that table. So I want to look just quickly at Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, because I think the word inviting has two meanings to me. I can say this place is inviting. And I mean what it's pleasant. It's nice to be here. It feels this is an inviting space. It feels good to be here. Or there's another meeting. I could say Anita is inviting me to tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it means that something special is happening that she wants to invite me to and be in, in relationship with her. So there's these two meanings, and I think Isaiah 55 brings us out, that there's an inviting in two ways that God invites us. So let's read it. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Come, all, you who, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear, come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. So I think about three questions when I, when, I, when I listen to this invitation of the Lord. Who's invited? What are they offered? And what are they told to do to get it? And so just for a few minutes, I want to look at that. The first set of people that we see invited are those that are thirsty and broke. They have no money to buy. They can't pay for what they need. But one thing that they do have is a thirst in their heart. They're thirsty. Have you ever been in a situation where you were just parched and all you wanted was a drink of water? The only thing that was going to refresh you and quench that thirst was some cold water. So this is, this is, these are the people that know we're thirsty, but we have nothing to buy with. We have no way to get this. You come with thirst in your heart. Your heart feels like maybe the brown grass during summer when it's been a drought and it's just there's no amount of watering that's going to bring that back. It's, you're thirsty. Some of us, our hopes have dried out. Our dreams have waited so long that they've almost died. They're like the brown grass in the, in the heat of summer. Some of us have hit dead-end streets again and again, empty, unfulfilled, dissatisfied, knowing there has to be something more to this life. Everything looks like it could be out of reach. We have no money. We have no strength. We have no motivation. But at least we have one thing. We are thirsty. We are thirsty for something more, something that satisfies, something that can fulfill us. And the Lord says, that's just the person I'm inviting to the table. Come, buy. You don't need to have money for this water, for this milk, for this wine. Now, the second person that we see in this scripture is the one that's, why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? So this is the self-sufficient person. This is the person that is described, um, they have money, they, they have ways to spend, but it's, for, it's, it's their labor doesn't satisfy so the result is frustration. These are, these are people that are not like the burned out, hopeless person. This is the person that is spending, working, dreaming, chasing, searching, experimenting, different job, different city, different church, different house, different wife, new computer, new boat, new books, new bike, new grill, new season tickets, new diet, new looks. They're just looking, looking, looking. 
but they don't find the pot at the end of the rainbow. They have things that this world offers us, but they're frustrated. Everything gets old. Nothing seems to satisfy. And I think about sort of our modern day prophets, you too, that sing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Like I have all of this. I have wealth. I have these things. And I keep going from this thing to this thing to this thing. And it's, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I think all of us, when we're honest, we get to these places, whether we are followers of Jesus or we haven't quite made that decision to follow Jesus, it doesn't matter. I think that all of us get to these places where we feel like we just don't have anything more to give. We, all we have is our thirst. We're hungry. Or, or we have all this success, but it's not satisfying. So what does, what does the Lord say? The Lord says, come to me, water. I will give you water, milk, and wine. I don't think the buying, for the people that don't have the money to buy, I think what it, what it means is response. Their, their currency is faith. We talked about that last night. The currency of the kingdom of God is faith. I might not have money. I might not have anything else going for me. But if I believe that this God this God is good. He's at the center of the universe and he loves me. He loves you. He loves our churches. He loves the people that are marginalized from the church. He loves. This is his very nature. He's a good, good God. So all that we need to buy is to just show up and respond, to receive. Now, water to me corresponds with the need for refreshment. So he offers us water to refresh our souls. I think about this when I think about he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. God invites us to receive refreshment, restoration, reviving, a new beginning. Some of you were here for the conference, and I talked to you about how last April I, I landed in the hospital after being sick for months and being misdiagnosed, I ended up in the hospital with heart failure. And by the time I got there, I had 10% effraction rate left in my heart and was very close to death. In fact, the, the doctors had just flown home, flown home from a trip to, from Thailand. And my cardiologist was like, you are a walking miracle. You should have never survived that flight with the shape that your heart is in. Like, you are a miracle. And so as the days went by in the hospital, I kept getting more and more bad news about how serious my condition was. But I, what, I, what I told the others at the conference was something happened for me in, in that time of almost dying and not knowing if I was going to wake up the next morning when I would go to sleep at night. They would come in and give me my sleep meds. I would put on a worship list on my phone and listen to worship as I would go to sleep. And I, this deep peace came upon me <clears throat> that said, if I close my eyes, <clears throat> I may not wake up tomorrow in this hospital but I'm not afraid. I'm going to close my eyes and trust that if, if it's my time and I open my eyes and I'm not here, I'm going to be in the arms of Jesus and all will be well. I mean, that, I mean, I wasn't afraid. And so something happened where the Lord came in that moment of surrender, a sacred surrender as I thought I could be dying to give me water and refresh my soul. I feel like he, he just had me lie down by the still waters and said, I will refresh your soul. I had no power within me to fight for anything. I was almost dead, but he came and he refreshed my soul. Milk corresponds to the need for ongoing nourishment. Every single one of us, when we're gasping for life and somebody's dehydrated, you give them water. But when you want a little baby to grow, day after day, you give it milk again and again. So God is not just for emergencies and mountain peaks for us. He's for our health for the long haul, day to day. He does want us to thrive in any circumstance we find ourselves in. So he invites us not only to come alive with water, but also to be stable with strong milk. And then the third thing he offers here is wine. Wine, I'm Italian, I love wine. <laughs> I was drinking wine from the time I was like four years old at the table with pasta. I mean, that's just the way it happens, right? But wine corresponds for the need for delight. 
God creates us to be a people full of joy and delight. He delights in us, and we are to delight in him. And so this wine, we want to live and not die. We want to be strong and stable instead of weak and wavering, but that's not all we need for this life. No matter how stoic, how unemotional, how laid back or poker faced every single one of us are, there's a child inside of every one of us that God made for delight, for shouting, for singing, for dancing, for playing, for running and jumping, for celebration. Celebration is a spiritual practice. All through, all through the Bible we see these, I mean, the Israelites even had time set aside for celebrations. We're to be a celebrating joyful people, no matter what our circumstances are. Now, let me just tell you a little, one little story about being in the hospital. So I think it was like the, the third or fourth night I was there. So Rich and I are married, and we have a blended family of eight children, 21 grandchildren. I come from a gigantic Italian family that a lot of my cousins in, uh, are in the Seattle area. So I end up in this hospital, and you know, word gets out that it's very serious. So the kids, the grandkids, like every night, my hospital room is like filled with like 20 plus people. <laughs> well, one afternoon, my cousin Danny was there, and some of our kids, and um, the doctor, the cardiologist, came in and gave me the very bad news. Like, there's really nothing more we can do for you. So what we're going to do is schedule you to have this titanium box implanted in your chest. I have this box here. Um, and there'll be three wires. It's a, it's a pacemaker, a defibrillator, and a computer all in this box. And there'll be three wires connected to your heart, and this is what will keep your heart beating. And at any point you start going backwards, the only option for you would be a heart transplant. There's nothing else we can do. And this is all, like, surprising. Like, this news is coming days of me finding, like, just... So I'm just crying. And, and, and the cardiologist... Um, as he's giving me this information, he said, and you know, your life is never going to be the same because your heart will never recover fully. And so eventually your body will adapt to your heart's capacity. So there's not going to be any more like running marathons or what. Well, please. <laughs> never ran a marathon in my life. I hate exercise. I do. But as it just sounded so serious, I'm crying. And he goes out the door and my daughter is sitting there and I'm just crying. My cousin Danny is there. And my daughter says, Mom, Mom, what are the tears? Like, I know this is so hard. It's all coming so fast. But what are your tears right now? And he said, Nicole, my life will never be the same. And she said, well, what are you most sad about right now? Like, I can't even run. And she goes, OK, Mom, let's be honest. When was the last time you ran anywhere? So then my cousin Danny said, what will make you feel better? How about if I bring you spaghetti? And I said, I would love for you to bring me spaghetti. And he goes, I have some at home. I made sauce with eggplant. And I said, I don't like sauce with eggplant. <laughs> he goes, what kind of sauce do you want? I want a meat sauce. So he literally went home and in a, in a pressure cooker made like organic spaghetti sauce with meat. So at 7.30 that night, he comes back to my hotel room, he and his wife, and they've got this big uh, picnic basket full of spaghetti and salad and wine and garlic bread. And like there was like over 26 people in my room because that particular night a bunch of our kids and the grandkids were there. So all of a sudden, like there's a party in my room. We're all eating spaghetti. We're drinking wine. I'm having <laughs> surgery the next day for an implant. When the, a new nurse comes in that night, a night nurse, and he looks around my room and he's horrified. And he comes over to me and he said, just say the word and I'll clear out this room. You need to rest. I said, no, I don't want you to clear out the room. This, these are my people. Like, this is fun. And he's like, this is not heart healthy food. And he's like, just disgusted with me and leaves. So the next morning, my cardiologist came in before my surgery and she sits down on my bed. She goes, well, I heard you had quite the party in here last night. All the nurses are talking about it. She goes, I don't think it was very heart healthy for you, but I think it was head healthy. And it's like, so I, it's just like invitation, party. This is our life. Even in the worst of circumstances, the Lord can break through in our lives. And there's this invitation to a party, wine that brings us joy that we delight in. Now, I think the reality behind this imagery that is in verse 3 God tells us this. He says, give ear and come to me. Listen that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love. 
for David. Come, come, come. Come for wine and milk. Come for water. God is our living water. God is the person we come to and we are refreshed by. He's the living water. He's the nourishing milk milk for our soul. And he is the joy. He's the one that imparts joy to us no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. And what he says is, I'm going to make a covenant with you that I made with David. And what was that covenant? It was a covenant that was a covenant of steadfast, sure love, a vow that God will never break with us. There is nothing we can do, nothing we can do that will break that covenant of love. So what are we told to get this benefits? We're told to come. We're told to buy. And in me, for me, that, that buy just means respond. We're told to eat, enjoy. And this is what the Bible means when it talks about faith. Our currency in the kingdom of God is faith. Faith is simply trusting that God is who he says he is. He is a good, good God who will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Now, what we want to do is we first have to respond to the invitations when God asks us to come. I know that there's people in this room, you may feel very burnt out. You may feel despaired, hopeless in your life circumstances. So God says to you, come. Even if you have nothing but that thirst, come and I will fill you. I will give you water for your weary soul. There's people here that have, have done well in life, but they, it just hasn't satisfied. You aren't so broke. You're not, you're not heavy burdened by bills and all that, but you, you resonate with that new house, new computer, new whatever, just getting on, getting on to have something that satisfies, and you're frustrated. And then I think there's those of us where God is tugging at our hearts to say, will you be, I've invited you, you've responded, now will you be an inviting person? Will you answer invitations from people that you normally would not hang out with? So I have one more story and then I'm going to close. About nine years ago, <clears throat> my daughter, um, she and I had had a rocky teen years and we'd been estranged for years, but that started getting... Um, mended and healed over time and and it took her a long time to invite me back into her life and so she was bartending at this very very famous pub in in seattle that a lot of young millennials hang out in very diverse group and so i some of you don't know my story but i grew up catholic 12 years of catholic school so for me <clears throat> coming into a charismatic stream has been a little bit um, I don't understand some of it because <laughs> growing up Catholic, we had casino nights at the parish. Like we, gr I grew up in a card playing house. My parents had poker parties every Friday night. By the time I was eight years old, I was playing poker, gin, rummy, pinochle, you name it, hearts, all of it. Like it just card playing was not an issue for us. So we, in our family, like af after Thanksgiving dinner, in our family, we'd always pull out the chips and have a Texas Hold'em tournament. That's just what we do at our holidays. We play c cards, we play poker. So there's a Monday night, I'm driving somewhere, my daughter calls me and she's bartending at the pub and she says, Mom, every Monday night there's a poker league at the, at the pub. They have a Texas Hold'em tournament, you should come and play. And I said, Nicole, no way, I'm not coming to the pub to play poker, no. And like, I'm drawing a line here somewhere, right? And she said, no, mom, really, the guys want you to come. They want to talk to you about Jesus. And I said, no, now I'm for sure not coming. I'm not going to sit at a poker table with a bunch of guys getting inebriated and drunk, and then they're going to make fun of me because I love Jesus, no. And she said, mom, they won't do that. You should come. So I called Rich. He said, go. Your daughter is inviting you into her life. Go. So I went, I played the tournament, and I won it. So I had instant <laughs> credibility with the poker kids. Instant credibility. Well, I've been playing with them for nine years now. And they call me the poker pastor. And so I'm actually writing a book, Poker Pastor, correlating poker with my life of faith. There's so many metaphors there. But anyway, that's off the subject. But here's what I will tell you. I was invited into a place that I normally would never go. And I've gone there now. And I've been there, you know, I went on a rampage and won like six weeks in a row. So they started bringing like little statues of Buddha as card protectors. Like, she's got God on her side. Like, there's, it's like, it wasn't a joke that I was a pastor. Like, they knew, right? And so 
Um, but I, w I answered an invitation that my daughter gave me into her world. Now, some of those, I've officiated weddings. I've been outside the door of the pub at 2 a.m. in the morning with young women sobbing about things that were going on in their lives. One couple is now a very integral part of our church. He's a worship leader. Like, I mean, I'm just saying, it, we might get invited into unconventional places. I mean, part of one of the chapters in my book is going to be from the poker table to the communion table. Like, we have to be willing to sit at tables with people that we normally would never hang out with and, and, and be inviting, inviting. Like, I didn't, I didn't have to... I didn't have to preach at them whatsoever. I remember one time, uh, uh, one time, one night at the table, this guy, I mean, they do get inebriated, and I hear all kinds of things, trust me, but one night, this one guy said, Jesus Christ, and then he looked at me and went, ah, I'm so sorry, and I said, you know, it's okay. I mean, I get what you're saying. I just love him so much, and he just melted, <laughs> like he melted, and so, I mean, I wasn't offended by him. It's like, this is him. He doesn't know, but God is inviting all people, everyone. Where are the places that you work, the places that you live, the places that you play? And, and will you be open to invitations into some places that you wouldn't, first of all, say, no, I can't go there, I'm a Christian. But maybe that's exactly where the, the Spirit of God is inviting you to be, to be a conduit of this amazing love that is pulling everything and everyone into this love. I think with that, I'm going to end and invite my husband to come up because Rich, I want you to meet Rich. Rich, um, <laughs> we'll be married 20 years in December. Um, but he has been praying and praying, and I, I know he's, the Lord has been showing him some things. So we're going to actually go into a ministry time right now. And so I'm just going to ask if you would just sort of posture your hearts to have an ear to hear what the Spirit might be saying to you right now. And again, what is our response? It's to come, to buy, to receive, and to respond to what something that the Lord might be saying to you. Why don't we just do that? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. You know each one of us. You know all of our stories. Even the parts we're ashamed of but you are not repelled by that. Your great love is so overwhelming. Come, Lord. We ask you to release the power of your Holy Spirit to heal, save, and deliver. Come, Lord. Let your kingdom come. I had a number of words myself this morning, but uh, a couple of things I want to share first before we talk about individual things. I feel like a couple of things for this church. And the first word I got was that God is going to give you even increased favor with the city and government kind of people. And with that favor, it's going to open up doors of serving this community beyond uh, it, it has been already. And um, you're going to be really surprised at how much opportunity is just going to come your way because of your heart to serve. And the other second thing is uh, I believe that God is going to turn this church into a church planting church, that there are going to be churches planted out of here, that God is doing a new birthing of that. That is a passion of the vineyard. We are a church planting movement. That's what we call ourselves. That's what we've been in our, our DNA from the beginning. But in, at times there's an enemy that does not want that to happen and comes against it. And I, I really believe this church was getting poised to be that kind of a church a period of time back. But there was an onslaught from hell that tried to destroy that vision. And I believe that God is restoring that vision. I, and I, I've also... I, I believe that there's a, a heart for training here, training leaders and having a training center mm -hmm. and that uh, you have a, a capacity to train people for, for uh, leadership and that God's going to release that for all of you. I just want to say something about what's happening here mm -hmm. so that it doesn't frighten us. Sometimes the Spirit of God will come on someone and uncontrollably they will groan, scream out, like something is witnessing in the spirit and that's like deep intercessory prayer going on. And so I just don't want us to be alarmed or distracted by what God might be doing, okay? All right. 
So a couple of words also, I felt, uh, I feel like there's somebody here, a, a man, I think his name is David, who has had some setbacks in business and that God wants to come and encourage you and say that he's going to open up a new door and a new opportunity because he does want to bless you in business. Is there somebody here that wants to respond to that? Don't be shy. Okay, we're going to pray for you. He's going to turn that corner. Wait, where is he? In the back right can over some, there. Can people surround him right now? Just pray for him right now. That'd be great. <clears throat> I also got a word about, I don't know if this child is here in this building, but I believe there's a child here that has kind of, I, I, the word I got was kind of like a failure to thrive or something going on w uh, with a young child that God wants to heal today. Is there a, a baby or you know somebody that has a situation like that going on? where there's a young child that really needs to be healed um, so they can really drink the milk and get all the nourishments and all those things that go on. Anybody know something like that right now? Don't be shy. People get, get a little paralyzed sometimes. It's like, what in the world is going on right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. other churches watching. Oh, yeah, so that's true. Yeah, yeah. Out. Yeah, because I, I really so felt that really strongly be... that the failure to thrive was the was the word that I got. And so if that uh, is somebody watching, they have someone like that in their congregation, <clears throat> please surround that child and pray for them yes. right now. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit. I also, oftentimes this happens, this happened during the conference part of this meeting when Rose speaks because I, one of her um, ministries and calls and burdens is to see other women released into getting into leadership. And um, uh, I felt like there's a young lady here uh, that is actually possibly still a teenager that while Rose was speaking that the Lord spoke to you and says, you're going to do that. Would you raise your hand so we can pray for you? Don't be shy. I know you're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's happening. Don't be afraid. There's a lot of intimidation around this uh, okay. situation. Yeah, okay, over there. We can pray for her. It'd be great. God wants to raise up leaders, men, women called by God to declare the good news. Declare the good news. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Another thing for the church here, I just really want to encourage you, is that as you settle more and more into this place, don't change the, the atmosphere of this room. <laughs> don't get caught up in, in turning this churchy. Part of, the, part of the invitation of this, this is a safe place both for people who are not followers of Jesus yet and also for people who have been a little wounded in the church cultures. So don't turn this into some churchy place. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what your plans are. I have no idea if you're like wanting to raise money to renovate things or anything. Don't get carried away here. A nice new carpet would be fine. <laughs> but I, there's something, there's, there is something about a room and the invitingness of a room and the culture that you want to create that's really important. And you've captured a culture here. I really want to bless it and say, God, come and continue to make this a safe place for people that perhaps are journeying from damage and woundedness from past church situations and, and uh, just cannot relate to the normal way in which church seems to look to them, but they can feel safe here. Lord, we just continue to make this a place that's safe for that process, both in its culture and in its space. And Lord, we pray for those that are being invited who, are, who aren't followers of Jesus yet. We, we, we pray for them to uh, feel comfortable, to know that this is a safe place, that it's, a, it's really like a family and that they can come here and be who they are and be right where they are, right in the midst of, of their story. So Lord, bless this house. Continue to prosper their, their finances. And uh, uh, let not money be an obstacle for the purpose of the kingdom. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of other situations going on here physically too. That, that, that God is here. The kingdom has come. 
and uh, and if you want need healing in some aspect of your body, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand and say, "Okay, Lord, here I am." Okay, people, look around. There's people all around you right now. Put raise your hand towards them. Put your hand on them, and let's pray for healing right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. Heal these bodies. Let your kingdom come here and now as it will be in the future. In the name of Jesus, come, Lord. Come, Lord. Heal. Heal, Lord. Restore strength and, and uh, bodily function completely, Lord. The pain and the discomfort that the people have been dealing with in their bodies, Lord, we pray for healing, deliverance. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just continue to pray for one another. There's somebody that's had a chronic sinus infection situation and it's just always difficult to clear it out. Who is that? Would you raise your hand? And right back there and there too. Lord, we'd ask you to touch them right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just clear it up, break it up, whatever's rooted in there that's not right. In the name of Jesus, we, we demand that it go right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heal those sinuses on any kind of chronic thing that doesn't seem to go away even with antibiotics. Lord, you, you can heal completely and root it out of there. Thank you, Jesus. If somebody has been dealing with a headache situation and it's kind of specific to me, not just that, you know, like people having headaches, but it's something behind one of your eyes that seems to be the pulsating part of it that causes pain and uh, it's very, can be very intense and sharp and it's right kind of behind your eye. Who is that? Could you raise your hand and we'll just pray for you right where you are? Again, don't be shy about it. Thank you. Come, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we pray for the prospering of the vineyard movement in this whole area, Lord. Continue to break down walls and barriers and past hurts and confusions or anything else in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring your people together. Bless your house, Lord. Thank you, Father.
we're going to move into what we call our vineyard ragged ending. We're a little bit like a raggedy end all sometimes, but we do ragged endings and we just continue with, with ministry time. Continue to remain present with the Lord, but we also free you to go when, when uh, you need to go and get your kids and sign your kids out. And we just want to free you to do that, Lord. Right? We just pray for the blessing of God to be on us now in Jesus' name. If you're praying for somebody or you're receiving ministry, just, just remain getting prayer. But we also want to free you up if you need to go. And thank you for being a part of God's kingdom here in Chilliwack. And for those of you heading back, God's blessing on you as you travel back to your cities. And God's blessing uh, on all the churches that are watching this streaming right now. Where we just continue to wait on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. to find 